Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Bits of Torah Truths. We are in a, a new series, the Covenant and Repentance series. Uh, this week's Torah portion is Parashat Balak. We're looking at Numbers chapter 22 verse 2 to chapter 25 verse 9. And I titled the study this, word, this week, An Act of Double-Mindedness. Now, um, while studying the apostolic writings, the apostle James, in James chapter 1 verse 8, he speaks of the double-minded man being unstable in all of his ways. Now, the didache, translated as teaching, is a reference to the teaching of the twelve apostles as a brief anonymous early Christian treatise, which is dated by most modern scholars to the first century. The Didache, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, it states, You shall not be double-minded, nor double-tongued, for to be double-tongued is a snare of death. Your speech shall not be false, nor empty, but fulfilled by deed. Okay, so James, both James and the author of the Didache speak of our not being unstable in all of our ways, but to be single-minded, having the motivation to do or to live what we claim to believe by faith. And this is why it is said our speech should not be false nor empty, but filled with deed. Now in this week's Torah portion, Balaam acted contrary to God's word and sought riches over remaining in God's truth. <clears throat> he seemed to follow in this way of double-mindedness and chose to curse Israel. Balak was pleading with Balaam to curse these people that come out of Egypt because he was afraid of them. These Hebrews of ancient times, as we see here in the Torah, were no different than we are today. And often, in moments of crisis, we plead with God to make a vow with Him, often unthinkingly and rashly saying, for example, O oh Lord, I will go to church or synagogue every week, or I promise never to use swear words again, or I'll never ask you for anything ever again, you know, etc. You know. So when when we think about this making a vow rashly and under crisis conditions, we we've all done this. You probably recall some big ones that you've either heard or actually uttered yourself. The problem is, is that if we are going against God's will, all the pleading in in our lives will not change the situation. The point of the vow is, according to Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, is that if a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now, according to these scriptures, the making of an oath or a vow in the name of the Lord is a risky business. It says in Leviticus 19, 12, it says, um, the Lord warns us, he says, swear... Um, he, t he warns us not to swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. And this is also the meaning of the commandment in Exodus 20 verse 7. It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord God of Israel states that if a person takes his name in vain, he will not leave that person unpunished. And this is also why Yeshua warned his disciples against needlessly taking oaths. You find that in Matthew 5 and chapter 23. In ancient times... When the nations would make oaths or vows, they were done so in the name of the gods. The idea was that if the person taking the oath proved false, <coughs> excuse me, you know, the, the point was that if the person, or the idea was that the person taking the oath proved false, the gods would deal with him. The scriptures warn us to not make oaths in the names of other gods. You know, the court, like it says in Exodus 20, verse 13. Instead, if one must, if one must make a vow or an oath, he should fear, fear only the Lord and swear by his name. Numbers 5, verse 21. We read according to the scriptures, when a person in ancient days wanted to make a vow or an oath, he would say something like, in quotes, you know, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not do such and such, or he might also say, um, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do such and such, you know, etc. So these things illustrate for us the significance of having conversations with the Lord in heaven and taking a vow or making an oath. One should make every effort to keep his word because the Torah says in Numbers 30 verse 2, 
He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And this is an important factor of our lives as the children of God, to be careful about everything we say, not just vows and oaths, but also in everything that we do. Note that Balaam made similar statements saying to the men of Balak, um, that me, the men that Balak had sent, that he can do only what the Lord tells him, yet he went with them anyway, going against God's word. In this week's Torah portion, Balak, the king of Moab, asked a Mesopotamian sorcerer named Balaam to come and put a curse on Israel so Moab and their ally Midian could fight against Moshe and his forces and defeat them in battle. The God of Israel, however, intervened in Balak's plan, had direct contact with Balaam, and revealed to Balak, one, even if he did curse Israel, it would have had no effect because whomever the Lord blesses cannot be cursed, whomever, whomever the Lord curses cannot be blessed, and two, the Lord God made it clear that Balaam could curse Israel. Or could sorry could not the Lord God made it clear that Balaam could not curse Israel. Therefore, Balaam Balaam would not and could not curse Israel, and so went back home without getting paid. So immediately following these events, we find out that Israel remained in the area of Moab, and Balaam suggested to Balak that Moab could deceive Israel and thus weaken them by getting uh, the Midianite and the Moabite women to sexually entice the Hebrew men, and in the process persuade Israel to worship Chemosh, one of their gods. And this work, this plan actually worked, and as a result, 24,000 men died, and the plague ended only when a priest named Phineas thrust his spear through a Hebrew man who was having intercourse with a Moabite woman inside the camp of Israel, killing them both. So the point is, is that what we say and what we do are both intimately connected, and just as a vow, a neder, you know, in Hebrew, a vow is a type of oath by which a person binds himself or herself to perform a certain act or refrain from a certain thing. A vow is understood as a promise, obligation, or prohibition that a person declares upon himself or herself. And in a similar way, we have all made a vow to the Lord God of Israel, and the one, and one day we will be called to account on whether what we said has followed through by what we did in this life. So, I'm thinking on these things, let's discuss these things a little further in this week's Torah portion. Now we're looking at, for this week, at Numbers 22, verses 1 to 21. It says the following, it says, Then the sons of, sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, opposite Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous, and Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pether, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, the people came out of Egypt. Behold, they covered the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come curse this people for me, since we are too mighty. Since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know, he that whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Midian and the elders of um, Moab departed with the fees for divination in their hand. They came and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. He said to them, Spread the night, Spend the night to hear, and I will bring word back to you as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of the Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there is a people that come out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. The leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the king of Sippor, Let nothing I beg you hinder you from coming to me, for I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to plead to me. Please come then, curse this people for me. Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Though 
Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could do nothing, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I'll find out what else the Lord will speak to me. God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam arose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the leaders of Moab. Okay, so that was that was on Numbers 22, verses 1 to 21. And in this week's Torah portion, the Torah states in Numbers 22, verse 7, it, it says, uh, this, this verse kind of stood out here, and it says that the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, versed in divination, set out, they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. That's interesting. It says in the New American Standard that they they contained the monies of divination. You know, but here in the King James it says that they were versed in the divination. It's interesting how we're told that they were versed in divination. And throughout history, innumerable methods of divination can be found around the world. And many cultures practice similar methods under different names. During the Middle Ages, scholars coined terms for many of these methods. For example, papyromancy is the practice of folding paper, especially paper money. Greek papyrus, you know, papyrus paper plus mantia, which is, you know, means prophecy. And the folding of this paper was for the purpose of divination. Now, divination is the attempt to gain insight into a question or situation by way of an occult standardized process or ritual. And so when we read in the Torah of the elders of Moab and Midian approaching Balaam to curse the people, they brought money to pay him for his services. And it is said that they had come being versed in divination since they were seeking to gain insight into the future, into a future event by some other means than in seeking the God of Israel. They were carrying money and were said to be versed in divination. And it seems to suggest that their trust in money to pay off Balaam was a form of divination. And when we consider these verses here, this is a warning for us today to not trust in money because it is a capacity to occupy occupy a place in our hearts in a primary capacity which may supersede the Lord God Himself. The Lord, however, is to you know, the Lord God of Israel is however is to occupy the primary position in our lives and in our hearts. Now when we look at the rabbis, uh, Ra Rashi has the following to say concerning these scriptures and his commentary on Numbers 22, part verse 7, part 1, he says the following. He says, And divinations were in their hands, all kinds of divination, in order that he should not say, I have not got my tools with me. Another explanation is, is this omen the elders of Midian took with them. They said, If he comes with us this time, there is something substantial to him. But if he puts us off, there is no use of him. Consequently, when he told them, stay here tonight, they said, there is no hope in him. They left them and went away, as it is said, and the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. But the princes of Midian went away. Okay, and then they, Rashi got this from the Midrash Ten Chuma. Now, Rashi concludes in Numbers 22.7 saying, the form of divination the peoples brought with them was not just in the form of money. That their divinations went as far as to their interpretation of the words and the way in which Balaam had spoken to them. The princes of Midian believed there was no hope when Balaam said to wait that night, whereas Moab thought there was hope when he said to wait that night. And this speaks of sorcery and divination that is coming from the heart. And this is similar to what Samuel wrote in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. It says, For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Is something that comes from the heart that leads on into action, which, you know, is a form of rebellion before God. Now, Sephorno and Dot Zekanim, they have the following to say concerning Numbers 22, verse 7. They say, and Sephorno says, the instruments by means of which to perform sorcery. Balaam's specific expertise in such sorcery was to calculate precisely when certain constellations would be favorable to what he planned to achieve. He is described as a sorcerer when his death was reported in Joshua 13, verse 22. Dot Zekanim, he says, and they had brought instruments of divination with them. They brought money with them to pay Balaam 
for employing divinations with which to curse the Israelites. This is the way the Jerusalem Talmud translated our verse. An alternate interpretation is that seeing that Balak himself was no novice in that art. He sent along samples of what he used when practicing divination. Okay, so Sephorno states that Balaam used the stars to predict and achieve his sorcery to curse Israel. Dot Zechanim states that their money was their instruments of divination which they used to pay Balaam for the curse they sought against Israel. Balak is said to have sent along samples of his divination referencing the money. He sent as a token to inspire Balaam to come and curse Israel. This led Balaam to a form of double-mindedness to say one thing but do another. The idea that money may be an instrument of divination is a warning for us on how we use our money in service to the God of Israel or as a form of worship in our hearts. Now the rabbis in Midrash Mekilta had the following to say. And they say of the following. It says that Ed and Egypt pursued them. This ostensibly redundant. This is ostensibly redundant. We are hereby appraised that not one of them stumbled on the way, lest they resort to divination and turn back. For thus do we find that these nations resorted div to divination, viz. Deuteronomy 18:14. For these nations that you are to inherit resort to soothsaying and diviners, etc. Numbers 22.7, and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian went with the instruments of divination in their hands. And Joshua 13.22, and Belan the son of Beor, the augur, they slew by the sword, and the elders of Midian divined, divined and turned back. Okay, so the idea here in the, uh, the work of divination is that a, where, a form of turning back to sin, back to bondage, because um, Midrash... Mekilta states that this, um, when the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt, if they had stumbled, they may have resorted to divination and turned back. And so this this act of rebellion is the is synonymous to turning back to Egypt and re-enslaving yourself, re-enslaving yourself to sin and to um, both physical and spiritual bondage. The Midrash speaks of the people not stumbling in the way of God and say that if they did, they have would have resorted to this divination and turning back. So the idea is that to keep our eyes straight on the path, to not stumble, but to focus upon the way of God and his Torah and to walk in his ways. And this is the example that we get from Yeshua the Messiah, that he lived our example. He said, I have done by example, follow me. Right. This also is a parallel again to First Samuel 5:23, which says, "For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Rebellion is a form of wickedness that the Lord hates, and is what the nations were driven out for in the land of Canaan." So the Lord desires for us to walk according to His Torah, to walk in righteousness, holiness, justice, and truth. Now the Talmud Bavli in Sanhedrin 105 it has the following to say. It says, with regard to the verse, and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian set out with their divinations in their hands, and they came to Balaam. It was taught in a Berita, Midian and Moab had previously never had peace between them, and they were always at war with each other. What led them to make peace at that time? There was a parable of two dogs that were with the flock, and they were hostile to one another. A wolf came and attacked one. The other one said, If I do not help him today, he kills him, and tomorrow he comes to attack me. So they both went and killed the wolf. Moab and Midian joined together to face the potential common threat, the Jewish people. Rav Papa says that this is in accordance with the adage that people say, A weasel and a cat make a wedding from the fat of the luckless. Despite their hatred of one another, they joined together for their mutual benefit at the expense of a third party. Okay, so note how the Talmud brings out the idea that enemies may become friends when involved in a common sin, and this, however, is not true. Not it is not true fellowship or brotherhood. A parable of two dogs fighting illustrates this when a wolf attacks, whereby these two dogs, who were once enemies, joined together to fight the wolf, who is a stronger than they. In the Torah portions, the daughters of Moab invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. The idea is that 
the two peoples that were not at peace became at peace under the guise of a common sin. You know, so they, the, the people of Israel were not to be at peace with um, Moab or Midian, but yet they went to sacrifice and bow down to their gods. And so they joined themselves with those nations. And the choice of words here in the Torah intentionally evokes sexuality, a theme that the prophet Hosea picks up on in his rebuke regarding the Israelite fertility cult. Hosea chapter 9 verse 10, it says that they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame and they became as detestable as that which they loved. The point is, is that the people did not hold fast to the word of God. And the point is that we are to hold fast to the word of God and to teach God's word to others by the way that we live our lives. Now the Mishnah has the following to say concerning this point in Pirkei Avot, chapter 4, part 6. Rabbi Ishmael bar Rabbi Yossi said, one who studies Torah in order to teach is, is granted the ability to study and to teach. One who studies in order to do is granted the ability to study, to teach, to observe, and to do. Okay, so this idea here, right out of the Mishnah, is that we are called to hold fast to the Word of God, have a desire to study His Word, and to do His Word, you know, to apply it to our lives. And by doing so, we are given the ability to study, to teach, to observe, and to do. The Mishnah here describes the proper motivation or agenda that one should have when he or she studies the Torah. The proper motivations are very important since before studying the Torah, one needs to have at least some purpose in mind, such as for the application to life. Studying with no goal is a mindless practice. And so when we think about that, when when we study God's word without a goal, is this the outcome of most Christian churches who teach faith alone today? Now think about that for a second, right? Is If God's word does not become relevant to our culture today, it becomes meaningless, which results in a loss of interest. Now how much interest do we find today in God's word? One should have the goal of applying oneself to teaching God's word to others, and this may be achieved by the way that we live our lives. A person studies the Torah for the purpose of applying it to life and to speak of it to others. This is meant to transform us from the inside out. Studying the scriptures needs to be approached with the proper mindset. As it says in Talmud Bavli and Kiddushin 40b, it says, Great is study, for it leads to action. The rabbis teach us in the Talmud Bavli and Berachot 17a, the purpose of wisdom is repentance and good deeds. And this is what both Yeshua and Paul taught us to do. The greatness of the Torah, however, is found not in its intellectual content, but in its content and relevance to us providing guidance for life. This is the gospel message. You know, this is what it means to be a gospel message. It is uh, for inspiring inspiration since it is the word of God. You know, It leads us into all righteousness. Right, And in addition, the Torah is sacred, holy, and good, as Paul wrote in Romans 7, verse 12. And therefore, studying it with no sense of its sanctity and divinity shows a lack of appreciation for what the Word of God truly is. These things are why the Talmud has placed such a central part or why, why the Talmud has played such a central part of Jewish life in the yeshivas, in the rabbinical colleges of today. The Talmud is filled with the lively discussions and debates of the sages. It contains the intellectual investment which went into the development of the Mishnah, which is the oral law. The Talmud contains centuries of interpretation and practice of the scriptures, and therefore there is, there is value in studying the rabbinic literature to understand how the scriptures have been traditionally understood. The basic concept is, while studying Torah, we not only study facts and conclusions in the Torah and the Talmud, we become a part of the text through our imaginations, we become a part of the stories, and we become a part, and they they become a part of us. And this is a transformative process. The scriptures are not simply an intellectual pursuit; 
It is meant as a way of life, a way of thinking and of viewing the world. The true student of the Torah is the one who wants God's word to become a part of his life. Right? Now, Sephorno, he wrote in Numbers chapter 15, verse 40, part 1, he said the following. It says, The marvelous ways of the Torah, through the study of which you will come to recognize the greatness of the Creator and His amazing love for His creatures, so that you would be free from thoughts of vain matters once you are no longer concerned with the pursuit of transient material illusions in this life. Okay, So, um, this form of Torah study is far superior to learning to teach because it requires a more profound understanding of the Torah than one who studies for his own edification. This is why David said in Psalm 119, verse 99, having greater understanding than his teachers. Now, in the Torah portion, this week's Torah portion, Balaam's wicked plan succeeded because the people did not determine their hearts to place God's word on their hearts. You know, make God, make the Lord God of Israel as a, a central part of their lives. As a result, he motivated a nation into bringing a curse down upon its own head where the Lord unleashed a, a plague among the tribes and 24,000 people died. Note, in the book of Revelation, Yeshua rebuked the assembly at Pergamum for eating food sacrificed to idols and engaging in sexual immorality under the influence of the teachings of the Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans in Revelation chapter 2 verse 15. Yeshua referred to sexual immorality and eating food tainted by idolatry as the teaching of Balaam. Now let's read Revelation 2 verses 14 to 17. It says, but I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name, written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Okay, so that's Revelation 2, verse 14 to 17. The sexual allure and inherent idolatry of the world continues to entice believers even today to draw us away from our singular devotion to the Lord. To break free from the spell of sensuality and materialism takes a radical resolution on our part. Something to note here, that this is part of the gospel message that Paul was speaking of in Romans 8.15 and elsewhere. At the beginning of this study, we mentioned that James chapter 1, verse 8 speaks of the double-minded man, you know, being unstable in all his ways. We also um, I also quoted from the Didache. It says that you shall not be double-minded nor double-tongued, for to be double-tongued is a snare of death. Your speech shall not be false nor empty, but filled with deed. Both James and the author of the Didache speak of our not being unstable in all of our ways, but to be single-minded, having a motivation to do, to live what we claim to believe by faith. The rabbis say that this is accomplished by devoting our lives to the study of God's word. But our motivations must be correct or our studies will simply be meaningless knowledge. We don't want our studies of God's word to be just meaningless knowledge. We want it to have value. Valuable knowledge is what becomes wisdom after having been learned such that our speech is not false nor are, are empty but filled with deed. The point is, is that what we say and what we do are both intimately connected. We must have purpose of mind to determine our hearts, to meditate, meditate upon God's word and to put it into practice. This is our obligation as believers and as the children of God. Though we are imperfect, we are called to live righteous and holy lives, to do the best that we can and to seek the Lord for his help and empowering to overcome sin in our lives. This is the meaning of faith. This is the gospel message that is being taught by the scriptures. If we live our lives as Balaam did, double-minded, 
walking in both worlds and neglecting the perfect way in which the Lord wants for us to search out, to know, and to live, we will one day be called to account on whether what we said is our faith has followed through by the way that we have lived our lives. You don't want to be caught shorthanded, right? Neither do I. <laughs> so um, the the point is, is that we we should uh, we should seek each day for faith, for the Lord to increase our faith, increase increase our love for His Word, and I have a great desire and motivation to serve the Lord according to His Word, according to His Torah. So that concludes the study for tonight. If you have any comments, please leave them on either the website matsadi.com or at the in the comment section on the YouTube channel. Okay, thanks.